the year 2020 is almost here. It's the end of a decade, and since Game Explained itself is nearly a decade old too, it seemed only right that we should take the time to reflect back on our favorite games of the past 10 years to decide once and for all which of them is worthy of being the game of the decade. But how are we going to figure this out exactly? Well, it involves an epic 11-part series. Each part will be dedicated to one year of the decade, with this one being for 2011, in which each of the five present Game Explain crew will present their personal choice of the best game of that year, and possibly the decade. Everyone will get 3 minutes and 30 seconds to make their case, which will be immediately followed by a round of cross-examination of the same length. Once everyone has presented and defended their case, it's time to vote. And we're using what's called an instant runoff voting system in which everyone will rank their choices in order of most deserving to least deserving, at which point we'll tally the results to determine the winner. Oh, and we're including you in the process too! That's right, our lovely fans will collectively act as a 6th Game Explained member, using the exact same ranking system. So make sure to vote in the poll linked in the description to make your voice heard. But just make sure to hear our arguments first. We'll announce the winner of each year at the start of the subsequent video. And speaking of which, we have the results for the 2010 vote. Congratulations to Super Mario Galaxy 2 for just barely taking the crown as our first nomination for Game of the Decade. And once we determine a winner for every year spanning the years of 2010 to 2019, we'll return for one final video in which we debate the merits of all 10 to determine the true Game of the Decade. So let's get to our 2011 Game of the Decade arguments. Take it away, Steve. Okay, welcome back. <laughs> We're here again, and I have to go first, but I'm okay with being in the weakest position, because you know what? I've got the strongest contender. Ooh. <laughs> My pick for 2011's Game of the Year is Sonic Generations. Wow. Hmm. Now, I like it. to get into why this is such an amazing game and is deserving of the title of 2011 Game of the Year, we first need some history. These <laughs> are all of the 3D Sonic games released before Sonic Generations. <laughs> so what do these games have in common? Oh no. <laughs> They're bad. <laughs> oh, I think offense oh. to that with Sonic Yeah, Colors. okay, you just lost for you lost me, man. <laughs> you know what? Just buckle in, all right? <laughs> <laughs> just buckle in. Sit down. We got some time. But wait. Are all Sonic games bad? <laughs> of course not, idiot. Just look at these. These are excellent. These are the best Sonic games. But what makes those games good? Excellent level design. These are amazing games. Try to, try to play through any anything in a 3D Sonic that's as good as, let's say, uh, Chemical Plant. So, uh, that's a bad example. <laughs> <laughs> Tight platforming. These games gave Mario a run for his money. Or I'm sorry, not Mario. Someone. A true <laughs> sense of speed. Name a 3D Sonic game that actually feels fast. And finally, this guy. <laughs> right there. Nice. How do you fix 3D Sonic? Combine good levels from both 3D and 2D Sonic games. Give the 2D levels a beautiful 3D makeover. Green Hill Zone has never looked so good. Leave the 2D mechanics largely the same. Don't fix what ain't broke. And throw in two Supersonics, because that's dope. <laughs> <laughs> I challenge nice. you to find anything better than two Supersonics. Finally, <laughs> fact. <laughs> Fat mascots are better. <laughs> Look at this Poindexter. What a <laughs> dork. Compare him to this absolute <laughs> legend. <laughs> it, it, it's just science. <laughs> Luigi? Way better when he was fat. <laughs> Andre put up Super Fat Luigi Galaxy 2 yesterday. Super Fat Luigi Odyssey? Got a mind blowing. <laughs> Super Fat Luigi Kart 8 Deluxe? Best racing game on the planet. It, it's just proven. Finally, look at this edge lord over here. He's so cool, so hip. There's nothing about this guy that makes me want to hang out with him. But this little chunker, innocent, cute, approachable, and still badass. Thirty seconds. 
To recap, <laughs> Modern Sonic is a trash mouse that only stars in bad games. <laughs> Classic Sonic starred in genre-defining platforms that made Fat Luigi look like a slowpoke. The only way to fix 3D Sonic is to turn it into 2D Sonic. <laughs> Fat mascots are objectively better. That's just a scientific fact. So in the words of our favorite mascot, nice. stay mad, nerds. I'm and the that's best. Time. <laughs> wow. Oh, the fans, the comments will not like that, Steve. No. Nope. Uh, I, I, I have a feeling the questions aren't going to like it, so let's launch right into the Q&A portion. I'm going to start things off here. Steve, you spent most of the video, the entirety of the video, explaining why 3D Sonic sucks, but I, do I have to remind you that that's literally half a song generation? <laughs> yes. Right. So... So how do you how do you redeem that? How do you reconcile that fact that only half of the game is arguably good by your standard? In every hot turd of a 3D Sonic <laughs> game, there's a good level. And Sega realized that and picked only the good levels out and put them into Sonic Generations. So you have only the good stuff. Steve, I played through Sonic Generations recently from under the Super Scope, and the quality does go down towards the end. Planet Wisp, which was a, that was a great world in Sonic Colors, it's a bad world in Generations. The levels yeah. are way too long, the gimmicks are obscure, and some of the levels of designs just don't make sense. How do you, um, how do you d d defend that? John, playing Sonic games to the end is for losers. All right. <laughs> so you're you're saying you you're gonna go fast. The game of the year, you gotta go you finish fast, it. John. <laughs> you can't finish a Sonic game. You start them, <laughs> and then because you're so fast, your attention moves on to something else. Learn how to game. Seriously. That's a, oh, man. That's a bad argument. You have a good yeah. game with a terrible <laughs> argument. <laughs> okay, so so Steve, you, you're basically discounting half the game here, as Andre said. Are you saying that you... See, I think that Generations has the best 3D style of Sonic gameplay because of the boost style. Are you saying you don't like... The boost style of 3D Sonic at all? Do you really no, only like? No, I, half I the literally game? just said Sega cherry picked the best parts of 3D Sonic and dropped them into Generations. I think. It oh, I thought you said the best, best levels from okay. every 3D Sonic. Yeah. All right. So all right. I absolutely love the 3D Sonic. He's not as cool as Fat Sonic because that's just science. But I, I do like the 3D gameplay in this game. It's good. I mean, this is my okay. personal favorite 3D Sonic, but even I will admit it has some weaknesses, namely the fact that this is supposed to be a 20th anniversary title that, uh, you know, celebrates the franchise, but there's a lot of missed opportunities here. We got no classic Knuckles, no classic Amy, there's very little interaction with everybody. It feels like there was a lot of missed opportunities, and the final boss isn't great. Like, how do you defend those? So first off, there's two Super Sonics. I already covered how great the ending portion of this game is. All right? But you said not to finish the game. Sonics. Listen, man, I can Google screenshots just like anyone else, all right? <laughs> Secondly, uh, I call that trimming the fat, getting rid of all the all the crew. Did you really like playing as Big the Cat in Sonic Adventure, searching for frogs? I don't think so. I'm Nobody not asking did. to play. I'm asking to interact and to see some Listen. fun dialogue. <laughs> Was there ever fun dialogue between Sonic and anyone? Team Sonic Racing says hello. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you're saying is so incendiary. I love it. Here's another thing too, Steve. Between all the levels and generations, there are missions. There are side missions you have to do. And a lot of them aren't very good. There's only a few that are good, and you have to do a, a, huge, a huge chunk of them. So how do you defend the side content? By not playing it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you have to play it. You have to play it. Um, you you have to no, I actually... Uh, so it's been a long time since I played Sonic Generations, but I... I don't remember ever hitting a point where seconds. I felt like I just was done with this game. I I actually have played through the whole thing, and I love it, but I'm having fun with this today. Really quick, Steve, <laughs> de defend the lack of a playable Tails and Knuckles in this game, because they're different from everyone else, Big and Rouge and all the all them. Because this is Sonic Generations, <laughs> not ta Tails and Knuckles <laughs> Generations, <laughs> bro. They're side characters. They don't get their own game. They're not that cool. <laughs> right. Well, that's all just right, about then. time. All right. Good job, I'll, Steve. Good job. Nice. I'll give that a half <laughs> clap. There yeah. we go. I'll take it. I'll give that a half clap. That's fitting for a game we have to fend it. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and move on. I believe, John, you are up next. That is right. Okay, fellas, buckle in. This is my 2011 game of the year. So, games. Good games are about mastery. It feels good to know all the secrets in Zelda, know, know to bomb a certain wall or like set fire to a certain bush, and it feels good to know where the, master, uh, the energy sword is in Halo. It also feels good to get through a Sonic level as fast as possible. So, 
Mastery comes through experience, though. You can't just master a game by picking it up. You've got to get better as a at platformer by, by playing it uh, more and more. You know where a pit is, and you'll get further each time when you know where the, where the obstacle is coming up. The same thing's true with Mario Kart. You're playing a Mario Kart game, you'll do better, of course, if you know the course better. And a good difficulty is one that you can master. So, my 2011 game of the year is Dark Souls. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, John, Dark Souls is unfair. Dark <laughs> Souls is hard for the sake of being hard. These are misconceptions. And my counter argument is Dark Souls is simple. See this guy? See the Taurus Demon here? You know what? He can be defeated by attacking, guarding, and dodging. Those are the three pillars of Dark Souls. It is not any more complicated than that. All you do is attack, guard, and dodge. It's a game of patterns. So, with enemies, they are limited by behaviours. So enemies would only do certain things every single time. So you can die, you can come back, they're gonna, they're gonna behave the exact same each time, meaning you can exploit them. Bosses have only a few moves and clear telegraphs. So this guy in the screenshot here with the big sword, he's gonna lift up whenever he's gonna attack, he's gonna do certain, um, uh, he's gonna just sort of show you exactly what he's gonna do before he attacks. So each time, enemies and bosses behave the exact same, meaning you can master them. And also, it's a game of mastery! So you'll get further each time because you can tell what enemies are gonna do, you know where they are, you know what's coming up. So Dark Souls isn't unfair, because each time you'll do better. Also, you'll learn enemy patterns, and it feels good to be good at this game. And also, if you aren't good at this game, you can get help. There are NPCs you can befriend, like in the screenshot here of Solaire. He'll aid you in a boss fight, so you don't have to do it all alone. And you can also do that with strangers, who can join you online. But the thing with Dark Souls is you can't summon your friends, it has to be strangers, which turns it into this game of communication and community. And also, bosses have elemental weaknesses, so if you have a, like a torch you can put onto your sword, they could be weak to that, making the game even easier. And there's also player messages you can leave for each other. So player messages can be good or bad, it can be like Zelda 1, where basically there's some random wall that you can get through, but instead of just like doing that with without any knowledge, there could be a message telling you to do it, or it could be bad by someone telling you to kill yourself. You never know what you're going to get with Dark Souls. <laughs> and also, there are entire areas and bosses which aren't mandatory and are completely secret. You never have to go to these areas. Some players will never see them. That's how much care and detail there is in this game. The best, some of the best content isn't even part of the main story. And story is there. But you don't have to know it's there. Basically, seconds. the story is a game of premise, and it's, the focus is entirely on the gameplay. But the game exists outside of the game. So if you want to go onto YouTube and find all these lore stories of Dark Souls, you can do that. Why is Dark Souls not worth rather than Dark Souls 3? I'm rushing for time here now. This is the most impactful <laughs> game in the series. Also, the world is the best in the series. It's open but focused, it's linear, it's like Metroidvania. You're going through these paths that sort of link together. Also, there's a sense of world building. Every single area makes sense in the context of the world. There's lasting impact. Dark Souls was nine years ago. People still think about No! <laughs> 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 oh, I love it. Well, John, John just got John. shot. <laughs> you, you overshot John, but I appreciate it. I respect that. So At least you actually defended your game. <laughs> <laughs> More than half of it, at the least. <laughs> so let's move into the interrogation portion, where you have three and a half minutes, John, to answer uh, our questions. So who wants to start things off here? John, defend this game to someone like me who likes games to have more colors than various shades of black and brown and other really dark, kind of pallid colors. Well, Ash, I don't think every game has to be like that. This is Dark Souls. And um, <laughs> if you want a game full of color, you can find other games like that. This is meant to be for a certain mood, I feel. However, it's not all just dark. Like There are, there are, lux there are luscious green forests in this game. There's um, Anolondo, which is just this bright, colorful, futuristic world. Well, I wouldn't say futuristic, more like uh, utopia, I guess. So yeah, I, I would say a, a big chunk of the game is quite dark, because that's just the vibe it goes for. But it isn't afraid to go for different tones as well. Right. What do you say to people who think the game is just too difficult, that it's just too frustrating to, to deal with? Because the game is renowned for how hard it can be. I think the community has overshot how difficult it is in an attempt to sell it. I feel Dark Souls is at the same difficulty as something like Tropical Freeze. And um, honestly, I think it's, it's, there's a bit of an elite, elitism, I feel. People say it's hard because they want to feel accomplished, when really, I think it's just as hard as any retro platformer. Dark Souls is no harder than Meat Boy. It's no harder than Super Mario Bros. 3 in some instances. This isn't that hard, I wouldn't say. 
I know you yourself have said that you, the first time you played Dark Souls, you didn't really get into it. You had to actually play another game, Bloodborne, and it, until you even considered this game. So how can you defend this game when you yourself couldn't get into it the first time you played? Look, Derek, I'm a bozo. So sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I'm just not in the right mood for a game. And I feel like you have to be in the right mood to fully appreciate Dark Souls. But once you're in that mood, though, you're in for one of the best games ever. There's a reason it's still so renowned today. And also, there is a dog with a sword, which I didn't see on my initial playthrough. And this dog with a sword, he, he swings it around, he's a giant dog. You feel bad for him, because he's just such a good boy. So Derek, I feel like... Asking that question is asking in the context of, is John an idiot? And the answer is yes, every single time. <laughs> so for me, I, I feel like while Bloodborne got me into Dark Souls, Dark Souls holds up on its own. All right, I got another question for you, John. Uh, Dark Souls is far from the only game that's guilty of this, but uh, I've never been a fan of blank slate characters, essentially silent blank slate characters. You don't really have a personality, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Dark Souls does this. How do you... How do you forge a connection with the guy you're playing as, or the, the lady you're playing as, if they're, you can choose, when you don't even know who they are, they don't even have a character? Dark Souls is subtle, Ash. Um, there isn't really much story at all, at least not directly. And your role is actually very impactful. I won't get into spoilers, but what you do at the end of the game greatly influences the rest of the series as a character. Um, okay. So I feel like the strength of Dark Souls is no character fully has, um, sort of holds the story up on their own. They all kind of do it as a whole. There's a lot of world building in this game. So yeah, while the character doesn't have a great impact because it is a silent protagonist, I don't feel like that matters in the grand scheme of things. Okay, cool. Right. Got about 14, or yeah, 14 seconds. If anyone else has anything? What's best build? <laughs> uh, it doesn't actually matter that much because you can um, you can start off with some beginning stats, but you can you can um, sort of customize yourself and as the time. game goes on. All right, good job, John. All righty, yep. hey, nice done, John. <laughs> All, All right. right, so I believe Ash is next, correct? Yes, I am. Here we go. My game of the year for 2011, which is obviously the correct choice, is Deus Ex: Human Revolution. Now, much like yesterday, this is a game that combines two genres I highly dislike, which is first-person shooting and stealth. I can't stand either of them. And yet, I spent about 100 hours in this game because it, it does both so well. It's so accessible, and it's just such a great world to get lost in. But the first reason Deus Ex Human Revolution is so amazing is this guy right here, Adam Jensen. He never asked for this, but I'm sure glad he got it because this <laughs> game, you guys, and if you don't know, I never asked for this. He's super brooding. He's a broken man with a tragic past, but he, he's not a jerk about it. He doesn't take that out. He's relatable. He's sympathetic throughout the entire campaign, but he feels cool. He feels powerful. He feels cool. He's easy to get behind, and it's someone you want to, to see his story through. So they get the, the, the playable character thing right, right off the bat. But in a gameplay sense, he also empowers the player. The, the, aug the augmentations you can unlock for his body, he's basically a cyborg, right? This takes place in a near-future dystopian society where humans have learned to augment their body with various cyborg-like parts. And this translates in into gameplay in the sense that they feel meaningful. You can increase your, your efficiency with guns, you can increase your hacking ability, you can increase your running speed, your jumping ability, and those let you access new parts of the environment that you might not be able to until later in the game. And that's all depending on what order you activate the augs in, and it's completely up to you. And doing so allows you to really customize your own Adam Jensen. And it feels meaningful. Like, you can go all in on the hacking skills, and that'll let you get into places that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get into until really late in the game, and get optional stuff, high-powered, you know, like, like really strong equipment, uh, and, and hack into, like, emails and stuff that you wouldn't normally see until later in the game. And I love that about it. It's, it, it's so all about, uh, you know, player freedom. And then, of course, those shades. Come on. Can you really argue with those shades? He doesn't even put them on. They come out over his eyes, and he just looks <laughs> that cool. I just love this guy. Um, but moving on, the world in which this game takes place is so detailed. It's so engaging. You just lose yourself in it, and you explore it, as I said, in different ways, depending on your Jensen's build. And what I mean by that is, well, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and do this first, but like I said, this takes place in a near-future dystopian society and does a great job doubling down on the moral quandaries that such a world implies. So, of course, there are people who augment their bodies, but there are anti-aug people too, and, and that results in terrorism and, and societal clashing and, and things like that. And it's done in a realistic way. It's not perfect, but I think it succeeds way more than it doesn't. Um, it, it, it is a very well-realized world. 
And it also really handsomely rewards player experimentation, because I was able to exploit the game's mechanics and the augs I unlocked to reach places that I otherwise couldn't have. And it's enormously satisfying when you realize that you've kind of, you take, you know, again, you've exploited the game to do things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do until later on. And it's very, uh, it's just very organic in that sense. It feels organic. It feels lived in. And there's so much optional lore you can discover by hacking into emails. You can lose yourself in this universe to an insane degree. It's such a good conspiracy storyline. I just adore this game to death. And to death. And to close, come on. Those <laughs> shades, though, man. Adam Jensen's the best. And uh, that's everything I got for you guys. Nice job, Ash. Right, you ended nice. strong with those shades. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. You're throwing shade. <laughs> yes, yes. All right. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move into the interrogation portion, where, again, you have three and a half minutes to defend your choice to our questions. Um, I'll go ahead and start things off here real quick. Uh, how can you defend this game uh, when it's in, in a world in which Cyberpunk is now coming, which has Keanu Reeves, I must remind you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this game came out way before Cyberpunk. I mean, that's it's like a, nine years before that. I don't think one has to <laughs> encroach upon the other, and I, I may get some flack for this, but I think Adam Jensen is pretty much just as cool as Keanu Reeves. The only difference is he's not real. But, man, yeah, Keanu Reeves is awesome, but so is Adam Jensen. And again, can can Keanu rock a pair of gold shades the way Adam can? I don't know. I, I haven't seen They're it. They're both questions. Know. I'm pretty sure he can. <laughs> <laughs> he probably can, to be fair. I believe you said, Ash, that the world isn't perfect. Um, you said it's not quite perfect. In what ways is it not quite perfect? Uh, what I mean by that is the, the way that it displays some of the social clash- clashing and the different classes of society is is a bit, um, I don't want to say offensive, but it's just they, they don't go in deep as much as they could in some rare instances. And of course, there is one character interaction I have to call out, which is a really, really, really embarrassing egg in the game's face, where there's an NPC named, named Letitia, and she's a black woman, and she is the most stereotypical, her, her, uh, her accent, her voice, it's just really bad. And it's one of the things that, that people make fun of for the game. So I'm not going to say it's a perfect game. But it gets so much more right in its depiction of a near future society where augmentations are possible than it gets wrong. And it, and it does a great job, I think, more than it doesn't, of showing how these, uh, how the rich, you know, rich people get access to these augs whenever they want. And, and so that gives them an advantage in life, whereas, of course, poor folks, they're lucky if they can afford even one. And you see that, you know. That, that engenders anger between different classes and it's just it's really it's like class warfare and and social clashing against the backdrop of being able to augment your body and everything that implies you know how much how human are you if you replace most of your limbs with prosthetics to give make you stronger and you know faster and better i'm not saying prosthetics in general i'm saying in this game um, so, and, and the game really doubles down on exploring what it means to be human, especially when you've augmented most of your body. So let's talk about the gameplay a bit, because you've talked about the story, you've talked about the character, you've talked about the shades. Uh, you said you can, like, uh, augment yourself in different ways in order to uh, skip things, but is it possible to kind of make the game boring? Because you augment yourself in such a way that you just kind of like, oh, it's this again. Uh, like, oh, hack again. Okay, I'm done. Whatever. I would say no, only because there are two main hub worlds that are so expansive without being op- too open world like you. They don't feel overwhelming. And these hub worlds are so well interconnected, kind of in a Metroidvania type way, actually, in ways you would never expect. And there are so many different ways to get through both the hub worlds and each mission. Like, if you want to be stealthy, you can. There are all seconds. these little ducks you can go through. And if you want to go just full-on guns blazing, you can do that too. You can actually play the entire game without killing a single person. You can peacefully knock out every enemy in the game if you want. You can. Adam Jensen can be who you want him to be. And I think the game keeps things fresh because there's always multiple options in terms of how to get somewhere, you know? You can hack into an apartment, but maybe if you're physically stronger, you can climb your way up into the building and enter through a window. So in that way, the game keeps things fresh all the time. I think that's what we have time for. All right. Cool. Awesome. Good job, Ash. Yep. Well Thank you very you much. Well, I believe you're up next, Derek. All right. Time for my Game of the Year 2011. As And as the... the uh, Presentation says, you should always trust Derek. I'm going to keep these taglines going because I am the most trustworthy of the uh, group, obviously. Uh, So, yeah. 
my game of the year 2011, <laughs> The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. How can, how could you guys skip over Zelda? It's a Zelda game. You gotta you gotta respect it. And I believe Skyward Sword is one of the best. Uh, it is a Zelda game completely unique to the Wii. It has motion controls that provide a very different kind of combat ex uh, experience that was more thoughtful than ever before. You really, you could just sort of hack and slash like any other game. Zelda uh, Skyward Sword was completely different in that way. It also has an art style that combined the softness of Wind Waker with the more more down-to-earth designs of Twilight Princess. It was a marriage of the two that uh, still looks good to this day, much like Wind Waker. And it also actually expanded the lore of Zelda in a meaningful way. It wasn't just sort of slapped together. It's like, oh, it kind of takes place after here. And, you know, there's some interesting bits. But no, this actually feels integral to the story of Zelda. It was surprising in how it compared to all the others. And it, it actually told the history of Hyrule, the origins of the Master Sword, and why Ganon just won't stay dead. And that's really interesting stuff to have explained. It doesn't feel just tacked on. It feels interesting. Uh, it also has some of the best bosses in the series. Uh, they were either small and tested your swordsman skills, like Girahim, thank you. Yeah. Uh, like Girahim, or were huge and impressive. They, uh, case in point, Kalaktos. You, the fact that you were able to use your own his own weapons against it and just break it apart is still one of the most satisfying moments I've ever had in a video game. But also, Demise is one of the toughest final bosses in the Zelda series. I don't know about you guys, but he kicked my butt the first time, and I really felt myself struggling despite having every heart in the game. Like it felt like a true challenge. Also, it's a titled Groose game. How could you not love Groose? <laughs> this is integral to the game because he is one of the best supporting uh, characters in Zelda with an actual arc. He is important. Uh, but it also highlights just how good the cast is in Skyward Sword. You Not only do you have Groose, but you have a great Zelda. You have a great Link. All the uh, citizens of Skyloft were interesting and had fun designs. And, you know, you, you came to care about them. And it's kind of the same way as Majora's Mask, because you had that uh, highly focused town that you kept coming back to and seeing how they went about their day and how things changed. Uh, and then it just got full of cool and clever ideas, like the time shift stones, uh, which are just neat in how you actually sailed the sands and had water form all around you, or you rewound time for certain areas in order to solve puzzles. Those were really unique ideas. And then there were actually some really strong dungeons, and our first actual search, search for the Triforce in 3D. Uh, I don't count... Um, I mean the complete Triforce, unlike uh, Wind Waker. Uh, but also you got the uh, excuse to upgrade your equipment uh, and actually gather resources, made it interesting. Uh, never had to worry about them breaking, at least a few of them. Uh, finally, where is my HD port, Nintendo? <laughs> These uh, HD port would work in the same way as Twilight Princess and Wind Waker HD and highlight the game's strengths. And the game is simply a gem with and one of the best time. Zeldas and Links. Boom. All right, nice job, Derek. <laughs> Thank you. Well done, Derek. Nicely done. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and go into the interrogation portion. Derek, uh, are you ready to defend your game? I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who wants to take it? Who wants to start things off here? Right. Derek, it's very curious. You went through that entire presentation, but didn't mention the imprisoned. Why is that? Uh, because the imprisoned is <laughs> a good uh, first and third boss fight, but a terrible second boss fight. <laughs> terrible. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it, it, the prison might go on a little bit too long, but hey, there are some things that went on too long in Wind Waker HD, like the, the gathering the pieces of the tri, the uh, Trice Force of Cor Courage, Twilight Princess gathering the bugs, and guess what got trimmed in those HD ports? Those. And so, in the same way, I believe Nintendo could really trim down on the demise or make it, you know, less of a hassle and make it actually interesting. So I don't think that's a weakness because... You know, it's it's aggravating, but what game doesn't have a uh, slightly ag aggravating part? Like, I'm sure you got aggravated in Dark Souls. Never. One word. Tad Tones. Tad Tones. Oh. <laughs> oh, you I was really in prison, but we already went in that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you really knew, learned the layout of those. So, again, <laughs> again um, of those areas. Plus, again, uh, something that could be tightened up in the HD port. I don't think they're bad enough that they weaken the game as a whole, as a whole though. They're just sort of 
trip ups. Okay. Mm. Derek, I you know I, I like Skyward Sword enough, but I think one of where I uh, one of the parts where I think the game really failed was its level design, its world design. 3D Zelda especially is all about exploring this vast land, seeing how everything comes together. Skyward Sword, on the other hand, has like three separate closed off areas that you have to get through from the sky. And also, please just defend the sky. Defend both those things, the world design and the sky. <laughs> See, I'm surprised to hear you say that, Ash, because you're the one that does not like big open world games, and this does not have that. It's a much more linear Zelda, and I, that can be a bit uh, divisive, depending on what you're feeling, but I felt like the actual look of each of these places and exploring them was legitimately fun. The only problem was what they was they weren't actually connected, which did annoy people and made the world seem smaller. But of course, as soon as I got their big world in the sky, uh, that kind of uh, took things down. And really, yeah, the sky is big, but you didn't have to explore it that much. That was completely optional. If you wanted to go out there and do all that, you could, but you didn't have to. You could just keep going through the game and uh, not have to worry about it. So it just, again, it doesn't seem like that big of a problem. Okay. <laughs> Derek, what do you think about uh, Fee? I, I felt like she was uh, a bit over-explainy in Skyward Sword, and I think I think a lot of people felt that she maybe popped out a bit too often. She does pop up quite a bit, but I actually think that's part of her character. She's supposed to be robotic and over-explaining things and just sort of has that annoying sense because if you look at her dialogue as the game goes on it actually does improve she becomes a little bit more personable you see how her interacting with link has made her more of a person rather than just a program which really is all she is and when it comes down to it in uh, skyward sword and yeah she can get a bit annoying with uh, her uh, exp- expository uh, settings but people don't like navi and i don't hear people people complaining about navi anymore i think that people just kind of got over it it's one of those things in your memory it just happened way too often and when you and actually think about it it's not bad all right well, good job derek yes, defending well skyward done. sword all right well i guess it's uh i guess i'm up right yes you so. are okay everyone's ready for the best that was saved for last right <laughs> was it another fat luigi game <laughs> you, you never know here we go game of the decade 2011 an argument for science <laughs> the the game of the year of 2011 is obviously portal 2 what else could it be unless the only way you could disagree is if you're a horrible horrible person <laughs> <laughs> why is this the case it's because well before we get to that we have to address one thing and what is what is my favorite thing guys what is it space space Besides space. <laughs> Dinosaurs? I'm not sure, Andre. What is it? It's not... It's. It, you may think of Star Wars FX. <laughs> it's not, though. <laughs> it's actually a brilliant beginning. You need something uh, strong to start the game off to hook you on the adventure, at least in my experience. Whether it's the oppressive nature of Hyrule, uh, an orphanage being attacked as in Beyond Good and Evil, or dangling from a train. You want some kind of mystery or some kind of emotional hook to pull you into the adventure. And that is exactly what Portal 2 has. You begin in a hotel room that looks completely sterile, but otherwise fine. Uh, but then you go back to bed and awaken in something that looks a little bit different. It's like the house cleaner hasn't stopped by for a few days. You then hear something. Knock, knock. Who could it be? It's Wheatley. This guy rolls in, he gives you a quick recap of what happened, and then he takes you on this insane roller coaster ride of trying to get you out of the facility. Uh, it is uh, it just a really fun adventure um, as, he, as he takes you to the next portion of the game, where the game actually begins. Uh, and that's where we go to my second favorite thing. My second favorite thing also is not Star Wars FX. Instead, it's revisiting previous locations in the game. Uh, here, we actually revisit the, uh, the the labs from the first game, but now they look quite a bit different, as you can see here. They're decrepit, uh, they're falling apart, and uh, it, it, you can see it, they're, being, they're being reclaimed by nature. So, uh, that gets to my point that the Aperture Labs in this game are basically a character. You can see the... the the test chamber is being designed as you enter them. You can see wall panels moving around. Sometimes uh, they can't even fit into place because of how destroyed this environment is. So the, the environment itself is a character and reflects the characters you're actually engaging with at that time, at that point in the story. Now, speaking of characters, this game has amazing characters. Of course, it's GLaDOS, which needs no introduction. We have uh, Wheatley, who's amazing, and Cave Johnson as well. Uh, just endless characters. And to drive home the point of how good they are, let me play a little <laughs> snippet here of Wheatley. Oh, I'm stuck again. All right, don't touch anything else. 
not interested in anything else. Don't touch anything else. Don't even, don't even look at anything else. Just, well, obviously you've got to look at everything else to, to find the escape pod. But as soon as you look at something that doesn't say escape pod, look at something else. Look at the next thing, all right? But don't touch anything else or look at anything. Well, look at other things, but don't. You understand. <laughs> Let there be light. That's, uh, God. I was quoting God. Who else can quote God <laughs> and get away with it? It's hilarious. The Pearl 2 uh, it, 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 uh, builds on upon the original. Uh, introduces new mechanics, like gels, which completely changed the game. In fact, it could have been their own game, but Val was like, no, screw that. We're going to merge this, it, these amazing mechanics with, uh, with the portal concept from the first game and introduce something entirely new. Moving on, the puzzles are brilliant. They are really tough, but they test your understanding of the game to the point where you can't accidentally solve them. Uh, you, you feel like Einstein once you actually figure it out, <laughs> and you can't do that accidentally. It's genius. Finally, okay, space is awesome. <laughs> as 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 uh, as I established yesterday, Mario went to space. It was amazing. We got speed through here. Uh, the game went to and space time. eventually as proof of this concept. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't able to finish. Oh, oh man! Oh my that, gosh! That, how many more much. did you have? Wow! Uh, it was it was, a, it was a long one. All right. Well, we'll move to the Q and A where we can where I can hopefully bring up those other points. <laughs> All right, Andre. I feel sometimes the story was a detriment to this game, it slows it down at places, and replaying it, sometimes the story just, it gets in the way of the gameplay. Do you feel that way, and do you feel this is as replayable as the first game? I have currently played it through one and a half times, which actually is probably less than the original. So, to your point, it probably isn't as replayable, because there is more of a, uh, more of a story, but that's why I liked it too, because it, it felt like more of a proper adventure. The first game I also quite loved, but it also felt almost more like of a demo of something to come, and I felt like, in hindsight, it felt like a demo of Portal 2, which uh, which offered more lo more lore and more of a story and just more concepts to explore. So, um, so I don't I, I don't remember slowing down the game to its detriment. I remember enhancing it. Okay. Uh, you talked about the new mechanics, but I believe, if I remember correctly, I've heard you in the past talk about how those new mechanics kind of got in the way of the core Portal gameplay, and you felt were kind of a detriment, like, to the point that you actually preferred the original Portal. So, now you're highlighting them as a good point, so, which is it? I think you're making that up. <laughs> 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 I could have swore I heard so. that before, maybe I'm wrong, but... Either way, some people might have said that. We'll say that. Do you, do okay. do they actually enhance the game game that much and change it up? Because they do take away and get away from the portal aspect a little bit. I think that they they, they diversify it. So I, I think they they kind of complement the portals in that they offer you a new way of interacting with them, which you're trying to like you know shoot the liquids through the uh, through the portals to get onto different surfaces. Um, you do have to think about the environment in a different way as opposed to the first game, which was portal focused. So I can I can see that as an argument in that it steps back a little bit from everything being built specifically around portals but for me i think it just added to the nature of the game and how to make use of the portals to interact with different substances and these you know and solve these puzzles ultimately are there good secrets in this game andre because i feel like the original sort of it thrived on its core secrets are there secrets in portal 2 yeah there are because so like in the first game you can still go behind the scenes and you can uncover uh different uh, different bits of like story or like graffiti on the walls. You can like see the glimpse behind the scenes of what's going on in this facility. Uh, and beyond that too, they have these really neat moments, like these little character moments, uh, where you like you'll only hear certain jokes depending on how you interact with the characters. Whether it's waiting around in an area, or um, or interacting with a character in a different way, like not picking them up when they request it, when they request such, or when they ask you to turn around. Um, so yeah, there's all kinds of like dialogue secrets, which to me are the best kind of secrets because that's where the humor really lies in Portal. It's through the character dialogue, and the fact that they made it even more interactive this time. Um, made it even more fun to uncover some of the best bits. All right, uh, Andre, just uh, just over 30 seconds. Um, all I ever hear about when we talk about the characters and story of any Portal game, or either Portal game, is GLaDOS and Wheatley. Chell doesn't seem that interesting. Is there anybody else besides those two characters that would draw you into the game? Cave Johnson. Who can forget oh, Cave Johnson? <laughs> like, you even could see this point. I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's still only three characters, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm done made. for time. <laughs> uh, if you have right. 10 seconds, if you have anything else. Defend co-op. Uh, also, <laughs> you, oh, you, 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 defend it. Co-op was amazing. I had a whole slide <laughs> yeah. dedicated to it. I didn't even get time to get to. I was giving you All an right, opportunity time. to talk about it. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you, Derek. <laughs> and that's the end of our 2011 Game of the Decade debate. So we're off to go vote. And you should go vote too using the link in the description below. 
Remember, your votes count as if you are a 6th Game Explain member, so make sure to check back tomorrow to see who won 2011, along with our debate for which game from 2012 could be Game of the Decade. Hey, if you click that subscribe button and ring the bell, you'll be notified as soon as the video's up. And with that, we'll see you tomorrow.